Before there was anything, there was Nzame and their two siblings, Mebere and Nkwa. Nzame would one day create the heavens and earth from nothing, and created the monkey, leopard, and elephant to rule over this planet. Yet still this creation felt incomplete. So, combining their strengths, these three gods created Pham, an immortal being in their image, to rule over the earth. But this creature became too proud and rejected the power of the gods. So the three gods decided to start anew, and they destroyed the earth. But, because Pham was immortal, he survived the destruction. So, to keep him restrained, a new earth was built on top of Pham, and another being in the likeness of the gods was created, but this time mortal, which would humble the creature. They named this creature Sekume, who would be the father of all mankind. The first inhabitants of mainland Equatorial Guinea were pygmy people, called Bayele Pygmies. These people tended to stay in the forests and lived hunter-gatherer lives, relatively secluded from any other African peoples. Soon the Bantu migration began, which brought Bantu-speaking peoples to the region. However, these people initially rarely contacted the Bayele, as they originally occupied the coastal region of the land. The Bantu people that came to settle in Equatorial Guinea are known as the Ndawe people. As the Bantu people became more accustomed to the lands, they gradually settled further and further inland, establishing farming communities. With the Ndawe people moving closer to the land of the Pygmies, trade relationships formed, and slowly, the Bayele would be married out of the gene pool, leaving barely any Pygmy population left in what we now consider Equatorial Guinea. And this is where I find a severe gap in historical knowledge until the Bubi people are driven from their homes on mainland Africa for one reason or another, and settle on Fernao Po Island. Three more migrations would occur, as more and more Bubi migrated onto the island, with many forming small divided communities. Each group of Bubi had their own chief, whose power was highly based on the approval of their clan, so the chief had to act in the interest of the group, rather than for their personal gain. A lack of centralization overarching the island meant that the Bubi were very focused on its internal politics, which diverted the Bubi culture, language, and religion very far from the Bantu people of the mainland. Some historians consider this the first divergence from the Bantu language and culture in Africa. But soon enough, these people would be in for a shock, as a Portuguese explorer, Fernaldo Po, would be the first European to spot the lands of Equatorial Guinea where he landed on the island inhabited by the Bubi, claiming it for Portugal. Fernal do Po named the island that the Bubi inhabited, Fernal Po, for unintelligible reasons. The colonization of Equatorial Guinea didn't begin until a few years later, after the Treaty of Torcedillas, which divided the world into Spanish and Portuguese hemispheres. As the island of Fernal Po was volcanic, the soil was rich in minerals, making the land quite attractive to colonizers. However, the Bubi would have none of it, as they fiercely resisted any attempts at colonization. Portuguese settlers were eventually able to establish a sugarcane plantation, and with them, these Europeans brought foreign diseases that would devastate the native people of the island. And the Bubi were not oblivious. They saw that these foreigners brought with them disease and pain. So, especially after the Portuguese tried to take slaves, the Bubi became increasingly hostile to the Portuguese. The Portuguese did not like the way the Bubi didn't want to be colonized, and thus treated them with excessive brutality. But eventually, the foreigners understood that the ferocity of the African warriors and tropical diseases made traditional colonization just not worth it. And so, the original sugar plantation would be abandoned. The Portuguese were very bitter about not being able to colonize the island. So, they began a sort of propaganda campaign against the islanders and other nations, painting the people as murderous savages that only want blood, wallowing in filth and disease. Now several trade posts by the Dutch East Indies were established, which was technically illegal due to Portuguese claims. The Portuguese caught wind of this, and they returned, forcing the Dutch company from the island. Portuguese relationships were established with the Bubi, now focusing on trade, and here we see greed take hold as the generally peaceful people of Fernau Po began a near constant state of warfare on the island to have access to more points of trade. No single chieftain would be able to gain total control over the island, but larger chiefdoms were now very common. On the mainland, European visits were quite infrequent, 
with the Portuguese only landing to capture slaves for the transatlantic slave trade. Meanwhile, elsewhere in the world, the Spanish and Portuguese were in intense border disputes over Brazil, as Portugal colonized much past the line that they were allowed to, according to the Treaty of Tordesillas. In order to keep this very profitable colony in the New World, the Portuguese sold the land of and around Equatorial Guinea to the Spanish. To the Spanish, this land was invaluable, as with their massive colonies in the New World and the plantation system used throughout this land, they needed a lot of slaves. But since Portugal technically had African hegemony, they had to go through a middleman every time they wanted slaves. So just like the Portuguese, the Spanish attempted to establish a colony on Fernão Po, but struggled due to tropical diseases and native resistance. The Spanish were able to make some headway, and made the island integral as a stopping point for the ships in the transatlantic slave trade. But beyond this, Equatorial Guinea was fairly forgotten about at this point, with the African land being placed under the colonial administration of Rio de la Plata, which is what we now consider Argentina. During this time of general colonial stagnation, a new group of African peoples moved into the region, fleeing from their position as a source of slaves for the trans-Saharan slave trade, pushing the Ndawe people towards the sea. But even here, these people, called the Fang, could not escape slavery, with the Ndawe now centralized on the coast, capturing these people and selling them as slaves to the Spanish. Due to this market of slavery, many Africans fled to the island of Fernal Po because of its fame among African peoples for its distinct resistance to slaves being captured. Thankfully for these African people, the British decided that the slave trade was no longer moral and should be stopped. The Spanish signed a treaty with Britain, agreeing to stop their involvement in the slave trade, which made them further lose interest in the African land, abandoning many of their ports, with Africa no longer having any value to them without slavery. Seeing that the island of Fernal Po was now fairly unpopulated, the British established several ports. The largest and most important of these settlements was Port Clarence, which was to be used as a base to hunt down slave ships. These anti-slaving measures increased the population of the island significantly, as many freed slaves no longer had or could not return to their homes, so they began their lives anew on Fernal Po. For a while, the Spanish had no idea what was going on in the colony, simply due to their lack of interest in the lands. But now that they saw the value the British saw in the land, they began to make a fuss. Eventually, these European powers came to an agreement that Spain would lease the ports the British now occupied so that they could continue their anti-slavery endeavors, and Spain would actually make some money from their perceived useless colony. However, the British saw that they were the only Europeans on Fernal Po, and so made several offers to the Spanish in order to purchase the island from them. The Spaniards refused, seeing more prospective profit from a continued lease than the outright sale of the island. They were wrong though, as the British slowly moved from Fernal Po to Sierra Leone. By this time, there were many plantations on the island, which were run by freed slaves, while Spanish involvement remained limited. But at least now, the Spanish designated the lands as their own territory, and they were no longer under the administration of Argentina. In Spain's other colonies of Cuba and the Philippines, the local people were tired of their European overlords, so independence movements began. The Spanish captured many revolutionaries, and not wanting them to continue to cause trouble where they were, Equatorial Guinea was used as a small penal colony, with hundreds of Cubans and Filipinos being sent over. For a long time, the French had been expanding their presence along the Guinea coast. So, to solidify their claims in Africa, Spain signed the Treaty of Paris with France. Before this treaty, the claims Spain had in Africa were somewhat approximate. But now, since this was the height of the scramble for Africa, territories needed to be defined for colonial rule. And for the first time, we see the modern borders of Equatorial Guinea arise. And if the Spanish weren't so preoccupied with the Spanish-American War, or the unrest in their other colonies, Spain might have been able to lay claim to much more land, and Equatorial Guinea might have been much larger in territory, like many other African nations today. Now finally some expeditions and colonies began on the mainland, where the Ndawe people were continuously pushed from the coast in favor of small Spanish settlements. Here, the Spanish established a small timber industry and some plantations. Soon enough, Spanish immigration to the colony began to ramp up, and colonization efforts finally increased. This is only after almost all of Spain's other colonies broke away, 
The local African people still strongly resisted the colonization of their lands. So, the traditional method for a workforce in the colonies, the native people, didn't really work out. This meant the colony had to smuggle in workers from other parts of Africa, which was both inefficient and illegal. As the First World War began, the Spanish decided to remain neutral after a long period of humiliation. So, many German soldiers from the colony of Cameroon fled to Spanish Guinea, as they saw the German focus on the European war and that the government cared not for the fronts in Africa. These troops were met with open arms, since the colony did not have the manpower or military to intern these men. The Entente powers knew of these men being housed in the Spanish colony and threatened Spain with reprisals if they continued to let these men roam free to potentially retake Cameroon. Under this severe threat from both sides of the Great War, these German troops were shipped off to Spain to live in luxury, appeasing everyone. Missionaries would soon increasingly frequent the colony, being very effective in converting many of the Ndawe, Fang, and Bubi to Christianity. Nevertheless, there were still consistent conflicts with the native people, especially on the mainland. But, after years of conflict, the Spanish were able to destroy any sense of unified resistance from the African people. This prompted a new, more direct rule in the lands, and the formation of the colony of Spanish Guinea, upgraded from a mere territory. Now many rights previously afforded were stripped from the native people to be able to increase the production of the colony. Forcing these African people into borderline slavery simply due to Spanish Guinea's lack of workforce. A small glimmer of hope arose in the African population as the Spanish Civil War erupted, in that there may soon be a new government more focused on human rights than the current administration. Initially, the governor sided with the communist republicans, but as the war went sour for that side, a far-right uprising began under the leadership of Luis Serrano. There was already a lack of a military in Equatorial Guinea, and most of what was in the colony was stationed on the mainland. This meant that the fascist uprising on Fernão Po found easy success on the island. Serrano had been in communication with Francisco Franco in Spain proper, and was given the approval to become the nationalist governor of the colony. On the African mainland, a sect of religious fanatics rallied an army of mostly Africans to march on the administrative center of the land, Bata. This army was intercepted by the Republican governor, Hernández Porcel, and after a short battle, the governor came out on top, expelling the nationalist army to Gabon. The colony was now divided between nationalist Fernão Po and the Republican Rio Muni mainland. But slowly, the Republicans lost hope, with their lines of communication cut as the nationalists held the sea and the war in Spain turned in favor of the nationalists more and more. Eventually, the nationalists sent a foyer onto the mainland, and the Republicans, lacking sufficient supply, were pushed into the interior jungles, from there fleeing to neighboring colonies, fearing prosecution. The civil war was decided in the colony before even in Spain, and the nationalist colonial government immediately began the process of gaining the favor of the native people by planning the construction of new amenities and by promising full Spanish citizenship once this war was over. The land was even promoted to be considered a province of Spain itself and no longer a colony. This citizenship meant little in practicality, and the administration mirrored apartheid South Africa. But this promise still gained the colonial government the favor it needed to remain stable. However, there would soon be external pressure on Spain from the UN to fully decolonize the land. It took some convincing, but eventually, the Spanish agreed to begin their slow process of decolonization. For a time, there was a short but heated internal debate in the colony on whether the island of Fernão Po was to become separate from Rio Muni, but ultimately, they decided to remain as one entity. The first president of Equatorial Guinea was Francisco Macias Nguema, who was elected democratically, but his rule swiftly became despotic and authoritarian, Nguema calling himself a unique miracle, and making the nation's motto, there is no other god than Macias and Nguema had a particular disdain for human rights. Political opponents or any dissenters were killed. He killed anyone who wore glasses or were found to own a book as he hated the educated. Boats and fishing were banned as a way to keep the people from fleeing his nation. The only road out of Equatorial Guinea was littered with mines. Medicine was banned. As to Macias, it was not African, 
Macias once had dissenters executed on Christmas Eve, and the soldiers that were the executioners were all forced to wear Santa costumes, while over speakers, those were the days by Mary Hopkin played. During Macias's reign, around half of Equatorial Guineans fled their brutal conditions. The people quickly became fed up with this dictator, and a military coup led by Macias's nephew, Teodoro Obiang Nguema Mbasogo, successfully stripped Macias from power. Macias was executed under Teodoro, and this new leader made himself dictator. While their leader was still quite oppressive compared to other nations, the people were simply happy to have someone less oppressive than Nguema. Soon, Equatorial Guinea found oil just off the coast, which gave a much needed boost to the national income. And with this discovery, came billions in foreign investment. For these investments to be paid back, it is crucial that internal unrest remain at a minimum, which means the oppressive rule of Teodoro was now propped up by many different nations, and that coups would be discovered and crushed in the cradle. Despite the nation's GDP absolutely skyrocketing, the average Equatorial Guinean's wealth remained the same, as the corrupt government hoarded its wealth at the top, leaving nothing for their citizens. With this new wealth, the government planned and began the construction of a new capital, Oyala, as a new, more modern capital for a new wealthy nation moving into the future. Equatorial Guinea would be the 14th nation to join OPEC, as they became one of Africa's largest oil exporters. Once the coronavirus pandemic began, the country implemented restrictions, and is fairly secluded enough so that the death toll and case rate are relatively average and stable, with the nation working with COVAX to secure eventual vaccines. And that was the state of the nation of Equatorial Guinea. Please like and subscribe if you liked the video, and if you have any suggestions or comments, leave them in the comment section below or email me with my email in the description. I also started a Patreon if anyone is interested in supporting a small creator like myself.